Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the, title, the title changes yeah. uh, a little bit, but the paper is exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, you know, Tavi and I recently met and decided that the title wasn't uh, that clear, and it had this iteration of the word physical, so we went for empiricism, modality, and uh, physical laws. Uh, the outline is as follow. I'll present the problem, uh, then uh, a brief outline of our proposal. I'll just mention the literature. I won't go through the details of the literature motivating the argument, but I'll mention uh, the, the main uh, you know, authors with uh, whom we engage. Uh, then here's a first claim. We, as empiricists, we will introduce an ontological claim, uh, then a second uh, claim that will be what we call the egalitarian thesis. Uh, but then there'll, there'll be a question, well, uh, why, if we are egalitarian empiricists, why will uh, why will we bother to continue to talk about laws of nature? After responding to that, uh, then we will introduce our third uh, main <coughs> thesis, which is actually a counterargument to what we call a dogma, what we believe is a dogma on the laws of nature debate, uh, and then there will be a response uh, from mainly philosopher of physics uh, who defend. The, prime, the, the primitive mathematical constraints uh, theory. Uh, I'll end uh, with a definition of physical laws, a uh, tentative uh, definition of physical laws, and I'll just mention, not address, a few objections. So that's the plan for uh, the talk. Uh, the problem is uh, quite evident, so it doesn't need much motivation. Empiricism has historically faced uh, several issues we, when dealing with uh, nomic modality. Uh, in one reading, Hume strips away uh, the world from such features as causal powers or necessary connections, and then most new Humeans advocate one version or another of the best system account, which takes uh, nomic modality to be just a property of uh, uh, theory, axioms in a theoretical system. Uh, so in every case, empiricism <laughs> in the Humean uh, tradition turns its back against the rare modality, reducing it to a dedicto property of uh, beliefs, models, and theories. So what we try to do is, uh, well, fortunately, we recognize that uh, Humean interpretations do not cover the whole spectrum for empiricists to work. So Humeanism and Neo-Humeanism is one thing, uh, but there are more, you know, other parts of the field where uh, empiricists can work. So we try to, that, that's important, we try to elaborate a form of empiricism that accommodates modality as a feature of physical domains. Uh, so tell the the rare modality in physical domains from an empiricist uh, perspective. And we call it physical uh, to distinguish it from mathematical, logical, or uh, metaphysical uh, modalities. Uh, in view of physical laws, we argue, uh, we provide a conceptual framework for arguing that laws inform us about physical possibilities and necessities in their respective domains. So that'll be a work working hypothesis. That's the definition that we want to uh, defend here. Uh, physical laws inform us about possibilities and necessities belonging to physical domains. And that's what I'll elaborate in the rest of this uh, talk. But here, uh, usually a problem arises, especially from people coming from severe training in the traditional standard debate on laws of nature between Humeans and anti-Humeans. They'll say, well, but you're not following the rules of the game. Uh, so you're not playing the same game. Because you're either Humean or you're uh, anti-Humean, but you cannot have your cake and eat it too. And we think we can. Uh, so I'll try to uh, yeah, move forward with that. Because if you're a, an empiricist, then you have to be a Humean and consider uh, uh, modality is just a property of uh, beliefs, uh, models, and theories. And if you want to have physical modality, then, okay, provide an interpretation, a metaphysical interpretation of the grounding for that modality. And we don't want to do that. So we don't want to be Humeans nor anti-Humeans. So what are we doing? So no, no, we're not playing the game. Uh, that's basically the response that we receive. When, uh, we are really tired about that criticism, in case you want to go for that. <laughs> for that. No, you can go for that, too, don't worry. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is the literature uh, uh, that we are engaging with. Uh, there is this beautiful chapter by Nancy Cartwright, uh, Sam Fletcher's uh, chapter on modality in physics, uh, Ned Hall in the same book on uh, a chapter on physical and metaphysical modality, 
uh, Hall basically argues that metaphysical modality ought to be reduced to uh, physical modality. Then Jean and Ismail has these two very uh, interesting contributions uh, for uh, a defense of modality from an empiricist perspective. Uh, John Norton recently published this chapter on how to make say possibility safe for empiricists. He doesn't always he doesn't only speak about possibility but also about about necessity. So we follow Norton in some respects, uh, but also we have uh, a, in mind Kenton's uh, book on modal empiricism, which I'll say is the most thorough elaboration of modal empiricism in the literature. And Octavio and I uh, seriously engage with your contribution. So we'll highlight points in which we depart from this literature. And of course, I'll mention uh, a few other references, but we do not directly uh, address the other contributions. Uh, and I remember that I gave a talk, uh, thanks to your invitation online, and, and Alexander was saying, oh, but you must read uh, Kentan, uh, Kentan's book. And we did it. <laughs> we, did, we did read the book. So thank you for your uh, advice. Uh, so two key tenets that we take from this uh, literature are these. Uh, this is almost uh, literally to be found in uh, Sam's uh, chapter in physics. Theories and models are expressed in terms of mathematical structures, informing us about uh, model <coughs> features of physical systems. Uh, so <coughs> Sam is brave enough, he says, model features of uh, physical systems. And we take that literally. So we believe that models and theories uh, to inform us about model features of the world. So that's a model reading of scientific theorizing and scientific uh, modeling. Uh, and then we detect what we call the Ismail Ruyant uh, Tailima <laughs> tension. <laughs> the Ismail Ruyant tension. There is a tension there that you have to sort out uh, for the character of laws. Uh, because, uh, of course, any attempt at adopting ontological commitment regarding laws would seem to lead us to endorse either Humean or anti-Humean views. And extremely highly qualified people fear that. Catherine Braden, for example, she fears that. Uh, Gina Ismail, she's always careful about not being Humean or anti-Humean. Uh, uh, and, and for example, uh, Kenton, uh, he says, uh, uh, here it is. So Kenton, we fully agree when, when you say uh, that there are situated modalities, situated possibilities and necessities, and we think that's perfect. Uh, but in your book, you still say, well, a nomological modality, that's metaphysical. So that's something different. Uh, I hope I'm getting that right. And we can discuss that. And then what we say is, no, all that there is is can turn situated possibilities and necessities. A loss of nature are just that, situated possibilities and necessities uh, that we access uh, to through empirical research, so by means of detection, experimentation, and so forth. And there is nothing like a super special nomological metaphysical uh, conception of uh, modality. Uh, and then Tina Ismail, um, uh, uh, in view of this tension, she goes so deep, uh, that the, the tension goes so deep that uh, non-Humean empiricists will be happy with uh, endorsing shadows of laws. So that's a metaphor, of course. We don't, have, we don't want anti-Humean approaches. Uh, we don't want Humean approaches. So what we have is something shadowy, you know, shadows of law. And that's what we try to uh, reify a little bit here with our notion of physical modality. So that's our first claim. Uh, and it's usually where uh, you know, discussions stop, because that's kind of a work for an empiricist approach. As empiricists, we introduce this claim, which is heavily metaphysical. And Jan would say, we say, we live in a physically modal world, <laughs> being empiricist. We live in a physically modal world uh, where possibilities and necessities are determined by the constitution, properties, or and relations of physical domains. So as empiricists, we acknowledge that we live in a physically modal world. Uh, and that modality is determined by the properties and relations of physical domains. Uh, here is a simple example. Uh, so I take uh, the case of so sodium chloride. Uh, salt is soluble, we say, and that's a model claim. Uh, it's a model claim that depends upon not a linguistic convention. Uh, it doesn't depend on a metaphysical posit, on a metaphysical close. Uh, it just depends on the molecular structure of sodium chloride. So some may say, well, sodium chloride dissolves in solutes, assuming that the latter are not already saturated with salt. Well, that's a more refined uh, model claim. And some other people would say, well, uh, sodium chloride necessarily dissolved in solutes. 
Uh, granted that uh, a certain set of ceteris paribus condition. And we're all happy with that. Uh, these are model claims about sodium chloride, and that's the kind of physical modality we have in mind. Uh, and here I may run into troubles, because we say the same goes for the invariance of uh, the speed of light. <coughs> Uh, the same goes, it's exactly the same physical modality, uh, which is confirmed by various experiments and which is independent from the weight source or, and, and from the inertial frame, of, uh, uh, inertial frame of reference of the uh, observer. So what we have here is two degrees, not two degrees, two scopes of generalizations informing us about uh, physical modalities. And there is no difference in kind, in nature, it's just degrees, and I tend to say degrees, but I'll try to avoid that word. Uh, uh, they, they just express modality, physical modalities of uh, different scopes. And as empiricists, we want to be egalitarian. So our claim that the world is physically modal is egalitarian in spirit, since we say that there is just physical modality. Logical and mathematical modality, they are all fine, but they are about language. Uh, and so-called metaphysical modalities can be either dispensed with or they can be reinterpreted as physical modalities when suitable. So that's what we will uh, try to do. Uh, and granted the egalitarian thesis, there comes another piece of argument, nomic modality is just physical modality. So it's nothing special. Uh, there is nothing making it different from the modality of this uh, cup of water on this uh, table. Nomic modality is just physical modality. Uh, uh, and here, we are aware that we clash with a long-standing tradition that assigns laws a special place in ontology. Uh, for us, laws are not a special kind of entity. Uh, we need not understand them as, uh, for example, God's commands, or second-order relational universals, essential dispositions, nomic facts or counterfactuals. Uh, the fundamental structure of the world, or primitive mathematical constraints, which are all different metaphysical clauses for redressing physical modality and try to keep safe uh, the place of laws of nature in our scientific imaginary. So we don't want to go that way. Uh, for empiricism, the soul goes unnecessarily too far. Uh, some introduce strange posits, alien posits to scientific practice. Uh, and some rely on heavy reconstructions of the details uh, that we uh, get from physical laws, from the laws that we have. Uh, so uh, here is the question that we usually uh, 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 you know, receive uh, back is, uh, but, but then, well, why would empiricism bother to talk uh, about laws? Uh, uh, in a separate world, that's just in brackets, in a separate work, uh, from the perspective of history of science and science studies, uh, we argue that we should actually do away with laws, uh, because they are extremely conservative in ontological, epistemological, and political terms. Uh, the best would be to do away with uh, the laws jargon and the laws posit. And we just can keep with different degrees of uh, different physical modalities of various scopes and models and hypotheses and axioms, mathematical equations, structures, and so forth. Uh, whatever you uh, will, uh, but we say, well, the laws jargon and the ontological posit of laws of nature is, well, Judeo-Christian, uh, let, let, let's put it this way, and it involves, you know, the governing uh, thing, and no, 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 so uh, it could be better to do away with that, <laughs> yeah. So for the sake of the present argument, non-human empiricism can claim that laws uh, our, our best attempt at codifying physical possibilities and necessities and ranging from local and global modalities and from stochastic to deterministic system. So they basically express generalizations about uh, physical possibilities and necessities. And you can think of any laws, and what they do is to deliver generalizations of various scopes in their domain, uh, as far as we understand them in scientific practice. And the difference in scope among these laws need not be grounded in metaphysically motivated ontological distinctions between different kinds of laws, fundamental, phenomenological, for example, or uh, nor, nor, nor uh, between laws and accidents, as I'll argue, sh shall argue in what uh, uh, follows. Uh, so the law's pragmatic relevance is unquestionable for the empiricist. We can keep laws if we want. Uh, they deliver guides for building explanations and predictions, 
and for deciding how to interact with uh, uh, both natural, natural and laboratory settings. So we can use them as uh, you know, guides for deriving physically informative, sometimes physically informative, uh, inference. So here we come again uh, uh, to a clash uh, with a dogma that I'm pretty sure you're all familiar uh, with. Uh, even if you don't work on the laws of nature debate, that's something that people believe as an article of faith. Uh, this is the dogma. Uh, any theory of laws of nature ought to distinguish between laws and accidents. And if it doesn't do that, uh, Mark Lane, for example, it's not a suitable theory of loss. It has to distinguish between loss and accidents, or between nomic uh, generalizations and accidental generalizations. And then, of course, the game begins. Uh, recall the familiar example. Uh, this example, I think it's uh, from Reichenbach, or perhaps before him. Uh, all gold spheres have a time each of less than a mile. And the other statement, all uranium spheres have a time each of less than a mile. Uh, and then we begin, uh, well, what can explain that? God's commands, uh, they'll say, second order relational universals, essential dispositions, uh, and so forth. And why? Uh, because we want to find a ground for uh, actually explaining why uh, uh, you know, our uranium, uh, uranium spheres have a time each of less than a mile. Well, because if it was if it was larger than that, it would run into immediate, uh, I forgot the word, immediate, help me here. Uh, fusion. Fusion. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry about that. So, uh, what we say is that this uh, distinction between these two claims is uh, rhetorically powerful, but it's ontologically misleading. Think if you have you know, two bottles, uh, one with water and one with pure alcohol, and you put them in the fridge. Uh, and you say, oh, one is uh, frozen and the other one is not, and that's what's going to happen. And then you will try to find, is it God's commands, is it, uh, you know, universals and so forth. Uh, of course, the example of uh, the gold sphere and the uranium sphere looks more scientific, so it seems more compelling, especially for those with, uh, for, for people inclined to uh, the metaphysical stance, seems more compelling to actually go and do the work and try to find the groundwork for the distinction. But we reject that. Uh, we follow two parts. So the first is uh, the physical laws that we find out about through empirical research do not warrant an a priori nor an a posteriori categorical distinction between laws and accidents. Uh, there is no way to actually find an a priori a categorical distinction between laws and accidents. Uh, they may be different uh, generalizations of various uh, scopes. Uh, but an a priori conceptual truth of laws of nature, uh, you don't find something like that in any, uh, uh, you know, warranted uh, way. And if you go for empirical evidence in the sciences, then, well, again, uh, you won't find something that categorically allows you to distinguish between uh, laws and accidents. As empiricist, uh, here we go with the empirical stance, of course, so we decline the temptation to distinguish between laws and accidents uh, by positing uh, metaphysical or mathematical presuppositions, additional metaphysical clauses. So we decline going that way. And uh, again, when it comes to physical laws, uh, we only have uh, ranges of possibilities and necessities here and there in various domains. And hence, we invite the audience to embrace the laws that we have uh, and not the laws that we wish we uh, had. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, one, one way to go about it about it. And then second, uh, empiricism embraces the ultimate, and we try at least to do so, uh, to embrace the ultimate contingency of the physical world. Uh, contingency appears in our most robust model claims about physical domains. Uh, things, think, for example, again of the principle of the speed of light, uh, which holds that nothing can travel faster than 299,792,458 meters per second. Uh, but empir for empiricism, this is not something one can uh, discover or establish by conceptual analysis, uh, but only through empirical investigation. As, an, as any other finding in empirical investigation, we may find out in the future that, well, the speed of light was uh, uh, different, or that we didn't get it, you know, it's approximately, uh, acceptably uh, uh, right. Uh, so although morally robust, 
it remains <coughs> thoroughly contingent, no background logic, uh, Otavio and Tchaikovsky say, uh, no background logic or mathematics and make this numerical value the unavoidable value of light speed, no amount of a priori reflection alone will render it uh, inevitable. Uh, and then, uh, especially from the philosophy of physics, uh, uh, people will say, well, but we have primitive mathematical constraints. So here we, I, I'm approaching the end of the presentation, we have primitive mathematical constraints. The PMC theory will say certain mathematical truths, certain mathematical facts, uh, constrain uh, physical possibilities and necessities. So 17th century, we have got. Uh, 21st century, we have mathematics. Mathematics will act as a constraint on physical possibilities and physical necessities, or so the rhetoric goes. The rhetoric is super heavy in this uh, literature. Here's an example by Tim Motley. So he says, in each case of a law expressing a differential equation, in each case, uh, there are models or solutions uh, of the equations from these mathematical results. Model conclusions flow like water from an open spigot. All one does is to treat a set, uh, the set of mathematical models of the basic dynamical equations, as the possible worlds uh, in a standard model semantics. A set of events is physically possible only if there is a mathematical model or the fundamental dynamical laws that corresponds to those events taking place. Uh, I, I, we can talk about that uh, for a couple of hours at least. Uh, there, there are, uh, yeah, there are. There is a set of assumptions in this passage about what I want to call to attention, your attention to is uh, to the uh, force of the rhetoric that says that you have a set of mathematical equations and then you work out solutions of those mathematical equations and you'll get information about events, physical events, that are physically possible or physically uh, necessary. And that modality, physical modality, will flow from there like water from spigot, from a, a spigot. Um, uh, yeah, uh, because, of course, in the philosophy of physics, this is uh, usually said in another sense, in a sense that, well, you can design a possible world with a set of equations, and then you interpret that world, and you'll see what's possible there, or, or what's necessary there, and you may end, run, uh, you may end up in contradictions and so forth, so you, you will explore the space of possibilities and necessities. Uh, but what I'm trying to highlight here is the way in which uh, you, know, you replace the standard talk of laws of nature, 17th century uh, style talk of laws of nature, and now these primitive mathematical constraints uh, that are uh, particularly popular in the philosophy of physics. Uh, uh, there is uh, plenty of people, uh, brilliant people, working on that uh, now. Um, but we can go on uh, in more detail later on. So, our response would be that empiricism fully recognizes uh, mathematics contributions uh, to the formulation of uh, physical laws, uh, but excessive focus on fundamental physics uh, laws will motivate the PMC theory, making us prone to forget about you know, the humble, inductive empirical origins of our most robust, uh, even of our most robust physical generalizations. Think of the speed of light, postulate, uh, and then, uh, certainly, mathematical formalisms uh, provide a tool for codifying uh, model information, uh, but that's all they do, uh, codifying model information, and do not provide a source for nomic uh, modality. Uh, then, what we need, of course, is uh, what Otavio and other people, Mark Colliv and Stephen French, have done. Uh, we need uh, to provide a framework for accounting for the application of mathematical structures to physical domains, uh, but, I, but I think I'm just going to go super fast here. Um, uh, you use lo lo lots of uh, different pieces of mathematics, variables, functions, vectors, Gilbert spaces, and so forth for modeling uh, physical domains. Uh, but then it's not that the physical modality comes from there, but only that from there you get your best language for codifying possibilities and necessities. And the ultimate crown is always uh, empirical, and you get there inductively. In all of that, I think we, <laughs> we may <laughs> agree. Uh, so, to definition, that's absolutely not needed, uh, but this, is, this has been a friendly workshop, so I, I'm going to be break here. I know you won't be too aggressive. Uh, this is a definition. Uh, so, routinely expressing mathematical terms, physical laws are empirical hypotheses expressing 
generalizations about possibilities and necessities in various physical domains. Oh no, we'll say the metaphysician, laws are propositions, that, those are not the laws we want. And I'll say, yes, uh, these are propositions, empirical hypotheses, but modality is not the dicto. Uh, modality is physical, and it comes from physical systems, physical possibilities and physical necessities. So we'll try to keep in the middle, uh, in, a, in a middle way between Humeans and anti -Humeans. Uh This goes beyond the conceptual frontiers of the Humean uh, versus anti Humean framework. Maybe that, that explains why nobody wants to publish this uh, paper, <laughs> because, <laughs> because they always send, the, send it to Humeans or anti Humeans, and they'll say, oh no, this is not the rule that we follow in the game. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so they do not require the theology minded distinction between nomic and accidental generalizations, and that model force need not be grounded <coughs> in, uh, for instance, a PMC. Objections. Uh, the first two, we have actually received them, but I don't take them too seriously. Ultimately, lost must govern. Uh, people have said there must be a lawgiver, but, or we wouldn't exist if there were no laws. Or people have said, well, if there were no laws, physics would not be possible. Uh, but I don't think that's something to really worry about. But yes, epistemic fears. What, we, what you have said, uh, all the audiences have replied, it's just a matter of model beliefs. So who cares? It's model beliefs, uh, empirical hypotheses, theories and models, model beliefs. You're not saying anything robust about physical modality. In the paper, we try to do a bit more. Uh, I haven't said anything here about that. And then another one, uh, we are not respecting the rules of the game. Uh, so everybody will be waiting for our view to collapse into humanism or anti-humanism. Uh, we don't think so, but we may be wrong, of course, we may be wrong. Uh, and then, this is an objection that I uh, uh, received from, you don't remember, uh, at a conference online, uh, and I couldn't respond it, and Otavio is now taking care of that objection. Uh, what happened with uh, physically relevant <laughs> modalities? Uh, because, of course, uh, models in physics, they have all these weird things, uh, there is no physical interpretation for that, and yeah. Uh, so, but we think we can have a, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have time for questions. Okay, that's. Short, short questions. Short questions. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have a question about th that thing. I wanted to ask you about something uh, on the modeling slide. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about why you chose that particular quote <laughs> that you did because the particular quote from Maudlin. Yes, your quote. Uh, no, no, no. Ah, Maudlin, Yeah, Maudlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's okay. The, uh, yeah. The slide labeled as number. Sure, two. sure, sure, sure. Um, because this particular quote doesn't seem like it's the. I wouldn't have thought that this is the illustration of the thing that you want to argue against. In fact, it seems like what Maudlin is saying, at least interpreted on its face, is actually just an expression of your view in the idiosyncratic language, right? Because all that he's saying is you, here's one way of interpreting what he's saying. He's not saying what, this, what his actual views are, but like from the quotation, you would think like, well, we learn about, we've got our physical theories, they're empirically confirmed in the usual way, we get evidence for them in the usual way. After we have those theories, which are ultimately empirically grounded, those theories tell us things about physical possibility. All the flowing is, is coming from after we have the theories and then we're making deductions or inferences from the theories that we have. Mm. What, you're wor what you're worried about is deriving claims about, the phys about physical modality before we got to the point where we have our well-confirmed physical theories. <laughs> But it seems to me that what Maudlin is saying is like, he's describing the procedure that you apply after you have the physical theories. And that's totally compatible with what you're saying, isn't it? Um, you know, that's a great point. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's an amazing point. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I already wrote it down. I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna go back to Maudlin's uh, work. Uh, but even there, uh, if he's, uh, f perhaps he's focusing, like Tina Ismail says in his uh, 2018 contribution, 
the mistake philosophers of physics make is that they focus too much on the end result. On the end result. So you wait to have your physical theories right or approximately right, and then you say, well, uh, where does dynamic modality come from? Well, it flows from, yeah, I know, but perhaps we are, you know, uh, focusing on the early stage of where, uh, you know, from where we work to get decent uh, physical generalizations about both quantities <coughs> and necessities. Um, yeah, Tina Ismail says exactly that in, uh, in the 2018 book, book chapter. Uh, and in the 2017, she says something similar, that in philosophy of physics, one of the mistakes is that you focus too much on the end product. Uh, and if that's the case, well, that, that will explain, yeah, definitely. Perhaps uh, Maudlin wants to say something similar, but we don't want to be any kind of primitivists about uh, nomic modality. Uh, we don't think that laws are something, uh, but we have nomic generalizations about physical post militant necessities. So there perhaps we will disagree. I just think that, okay, I'll, I'll just, <laughs> maybe you can find a quote that illustrates that, that's the main thing. Oh, perfect, yes, yes, I'll take care. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christian, great talk. Uh, I, I will try to, try to not to put forward the same old objection about you having your cake and eating it too, but I will <laughs> ask a related question. And, and empiricism can be said to be many things, but well, it's a philosophical tradition that gives uh, <coughs> experience a key central role in warranting uh, ontological commitments, and, yeah. and especially to perception. So, so I, I, I was wondering what, what's the, the, the relationship between your ontological commitments with physically necessary and um, possible facts to the domain of perception. Perception. Hundreds of pages in this book. <laughs> yeah. So in the context book, there's hundreds of pages to explain. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Ken Kentan's book is really good. Yeah. No, it's really good. Yeah, I'm not joking. It's really good. And, uh, uh, yeah, and a few people like Kentan, uh, John Norton, and, uh, uh, well, the other people I mentioned here, they don't work on, uh, uh, yeah, how you get to, you know, uh, modally infused theories and, and, and models. And Norton, for example, will say, well, what's, uh, he will relate modality with evidence, and he will say what's possible, uh, it's what evidence uh, uh, positively allows. And what's necessary for the empiricist is what evidence compels. Uh, compels. But of course, he falls uh, into the problem of uh, offering thresholds for the amount of evidence you need for uh, judging possibilities and necessities. Uh, but yeah, I, I couldn't go for perception, I'll go for observation, detection, experimentation, replication, and so forth. Uh, yeah, and yeah, different procedures for gathering evidence, so long as you have evidence. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Christian, I want to try to say something constructive about the worry that you keep encountering is this humanism and the non humanism, right? I think the issue here may be that um, people, just to follow on Bruno's point, want to understand what, in what sense this is an empiricist view, right? Ah. So, and so the issue is that you say that physical modality in the world is something that's determined by properties of relations or depends on properties of yes. relations. Yes. And what people want to know is, so what is the determination relation? What is the dependence relation? Mm. And historically, right, some people have said, well, I'll tell you what it is. And then they spell out a metaphysical proposal. That's a non-human view. Or they'll say, I'll tell you what it is. And they'll spell it out in a deflationary way, right, in a de dicto way. And that's a non-human view. Now, to the extent that you don't spell out this relation, that must be frustrating for people, right? Sure. Because sure. they want to know what you need. What is the determination relation? What is the dependence relation, yeah. right? Now, there are routes you can go. You can say, well, I'm a primitive structure. I'm not going to say anything. <coughs> I think that that's not what you want to say. Yeah, yeah. But then you've got to say something. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and so we're waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how Anjan asks the question. So it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yes. Uh, no, but you'll have to wait a little bit more. Uh, or we, or we, or we, or or maybe, or no, wait until I send you the manuscript. We try to say something there. Uh, I, I, you just reminded me of uh, James Goodward's complaints 
I'm not sure if you have read uh, any of you have read this uh, chapter uh, where Woodward speaks. Uh, he has a dialogue. He makes up a dialogue between a Platonist metaphysician and he himself and James. Uh, and he basically complains that all these words, determination, determinable, laws, uh, dispositions, are co-opted by the mainstream metaphysics, and that he feels fully free to use the same words in a different sense. But of course, he spells out what he says by that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'll send you the, the manuscript. Yeah, yeah. But we will certainly try to avoid engaging, especially in a paper size, in a paper length manuscript, will certainly try to avoid engage with all this metaphysical debate. It will, yeah, try us away. Mm. So you don't think it's empiricist? Well, I'd like to know the sense in which it is. Yeah. <laughs> right now, I don't know, because I don't know what determination of independence is, in your view. Yes, OK. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm going to write that down. Yeah, thank you. Christian? I, OK. Uh, OK, I, I had a. Uh, some question before and also similar to Anton, so I, I, should, I should ask something different. <laughs> no, I, I, I can ask something different. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> but just to emphasize the point, I mean, the, the modeling is called, for me, is absolutely neutral with respect to this discussion. I mean, this is the usual way in which philosopher of physics usually just lay out uh, what dynamical rules mm. could, you could How could you get something like modeled from dynamical rules? Yeah, your paper, 2020. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, but this is different. Yeah, 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 I'm going to that. But yeah. this is, I mean, I, I agree with, 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 with Sam that that doesn't reflect what deep modeling's view is usually. I mean, it's nothing about like primitivism, it's nothing about ah, that. Ah, tell yeah, me yeah, more yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, a, I mean, I, I, I could imagine that someone like, I don't know, John Ehrman could perfectly agree with that, I and mean, it's not the modern style philosophy, but I could agree with that, and I disagree with modern, but also, yeah. it's a very neutral description of yeah, what is yeah, going yeah. on, yeah. and you have to do, to add something else to say, okay, this is modern talking, and yeah. this is not modern talking, it's just any random philosopher of physics talking. Right? Yeah. This yeah. is, the, I think, this is what uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. someone wanted to yeah. say, and also I agree with that. Um, yes. But there's something that there that the is, is uh, that goes against what you said before. You said at some point that uh, I mean this is in your favor. Uh, this is th this definition of uh, modality relates uh, modality with laws. Right? Yeah. We, we we can obtain something about modality in any sense only through the laws. But you at some point you say okay I I, I don't believe that nomological modality collapses with physical modality. So uh, if I understood you right, you are thinking of Okay, we can imagine some physical modality that is not related to the laws. It's related to something else. Otherwise, <coughs> they, they usually collapse. Or they usually think that physical modality is obtained through the laws. So I, I want to hear if, if what what who else could be. I mean, uh, usually we think of modality in terms of law, uh, physical modality in terms of laws. That's the definition. But you said that they don't collapse. So probably you are thinking that there is another source for physical modality that is not in the laws, it's somewhere else, but I would like to hear <laughs> where. Yes, yes. So we definitely do not think that laws impose modality on the world. No. Okay. Yeah, so we don't think that. Uh, we think there is just physical modality. Okay. And that what physical laws do is uh, to codify and express our best generalizations about possibilities and necessities. And that those possibilities and necessities depends upon the constitution of physical domains, <laughs> properties, and relations. Yeah, and then they're going to engage with uh, the metaphysical language. Yeah, um, uh, but the fear, the collapse fear, had to do with uh, collapsing with either humanism or anti-humanism. Okay. Yeah. So, but you don't think that uh, physical laws give you physical modality. You don't think to that. To inform you about physical modality, yes. Okay, but so physical modality should be grounded in something else. Or uh, yeah, just pretty yeah, physical domains. Uh, yeah, but it is too bad. I mean, it is, uh, I mean, uh, again, I mean, you could say, yeah, okay, they are just primitive, right? They are just out there. Okay, fine. But uh, no, this is just one position that, that could be also I would like to hear, okay, what is ground in this physical modality? Or what, what else, I mean, is, is giving meaning well, to this? To this depends on the context. Uh, okay, for the Hooke's law, context. for the Hooke's law, uh, different kinds of uh, springs. For Coulomb's, Coulomb's law, uh, uh -huh. okay. 
mm -hmm. electrostatic propulsion. Um, yeah, and okay, okay, okay. Forth, okay. And so things that are, that are, yeah, physical domains. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But, okay. but um, uh, for example, the Humean will uh, reconstruct metaphysically in such a way the world that they will say, well, these are LA model properties, spatial temporally distributed, and we say, no, that's too much. <laughs> And Taichemians, they'll say, no, oh, it's God commands or universal sort of dispositions, metaphysically understood, and so forth. And we'll say, no, that's too much. So, what is it? Well, <laughs> <coughs> okay, yeah. Okay. Sodium chloride, uh, you know, water, <coughs> electrons, and okay, light okay. speed, and, and how you access physical modality through experimental research, detections, measurements, and so forth. And then you get evidence for your model claims. Yeah. We, we, we can talk about that. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you, thank you. Sorry thank you. for the people that could not ask. Thank you for... Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you.